Hey friends, welcome to the part two of this finance Q&A with Michael Modica. Mike is a Harvard MBA graduate and a finance expert and a coach. And together we're discussing super interesting topics like how to save, what to invest in, how to be more financially literate, very important topics for everyone. If you haven't seen part one, that will be linked down below. Otherwise, have fun. Often hear people talk about the importance of investing, but I think a big question that a lot of people have is okay, I understand investing is good, but how do I invest or what do I actually even invest in? So, what would you recommend? What should people invest in? Okay, good, yeah, great question. Um, and it's I'm gonna speak at least initially for people your age, uh, late 20s, early 30s. You have 50 years of life ahead of you. Time is what's on your side. So young people in particular, uh, the greatest wealth builder available are equities, or sometimes just called the stock market. Um, now, a lot of people, even young people, can be afraid of it because the stock market from time to time, even within a young person's lifetime, you would have seen the sudden crash of 2008. I can go back and name three or four other ones in my life uh, where you wake up one day and your stock holding was worth a thousand dollars and next morning it's six hundred dollars and people will get panicked out of it. Okay. Um, so, and it takes us a, a very uh, disciplined person. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is the, the broadest index is available to most Americans or a very broad one, which is highly recommended is uh, an exchange traded fund that owns all 500 stocks in the S&P 500, known as the S&P. Uh, there are different symbols for it, and they're offered by Fidelity, by Vanguard, by Schwab. And an investment in that by a young person, and yes, up to 100% in, in some cases, you can put just all your money in one simple symbol called SPY and reinvest the dividends. Uh, SPY yields to 2.2%, something like that over time. So when the dividends come in, you just buy more SPY. And the key to a regular savings program is exactly that, regular. In other words, that 10 to 15% that we're talking about uh, paying yourself first should go set, up, set yourself up a Schwab or Fidelity account, one of those really low cost ones or Vanguard. Vanguard is the one who really thought these concepts up and uh, just buy SPY or there are even broader indices you can buy. You can buy the Russell 5000, which was the top 5000 companies in the United States. Contained within that one stock symbol is industry diversification because you have high tech companies, you have banks, you have uh, real estate companies, you've got manufacturing, you've got pharmaceuticals, you've got the entire United States economy cross section in that. That is the simple for people who don't wanna follow the market that's my simplest advice is 10 to 15% buy SPY, do it regularly and don't ever miss a month. And someone's going to say, oh, but Mike, the market just crashed 40%. This is terrible. No, it's not. You have to think about it for a second. As a young person, you want the market to crash because you're going to then with your regular savings amount, that regular, say it's $500 a month you're putting away. And if the S&P was at 100, that buys you five shares. Now the S&P drops to 60 and you've bought nine shares. So that idea of investing regularly over time means you will buy more shares of the index when it happens to be low and you'll buy fewer when it happens to be high all by itself without having to do anything. But again, it's the, the regularity of it and the time being on your side. A very simple example of the power of compound money, and this will involve some figures, so I'll just keep it very, very simple, but I did it just to see. Uh, anybody who makes decent money and starts early enough can retire with a million dollars. And you say, wow, that makes me a millionaire. Yes, and it's, it's, but it's not gonna happen. You have to be intentional. There's that word again. So the, and I ran a spreadsheet just to show that it was true. If one is able to put away $500 per month in SPY, and SPY continues to return the roughly 8% it's returned for the past 100 years. Again, no guarantee the whole world could go to hell between now and then, nobody knows, but 100 years is pretty good history. So at that 8%, $500 a month, 
in 33 years, you will have a balance just north of a million dollars. That's great. You know what's even better? Out of the million dollars, only 200,000 of it is the money you invested. The rest of it is the compound growth on the 8%. Because you put in $100, in a year you have 108. The 108 is all your money. So now your 8% is growing on 108. And then the next year it's 116 plus the accrued interest on the eight. And it is absolutely magical. Uh, I think John Kenneth Galbraith identified it as the eighth wonder of the world, compound interest. And the longer you have, the longer your runway, the more powerful that compound interest effect becomes because it's not an arithmetic calculation. It's a geometric calculation. And anybody who wants to know more about that, there's just give me a call or uh, again, early, regular, discipline, never miss a month. That's how you'll get rich. Mm -hmm. Yeah, every time I hear the numbers about compound interest, I'm always so blown away as to why not more people are doing this or I, I don't know, it's, it's, it's absolutely amazing. Well, it's because they, you know, I, I candidly, excuse me for interjecting so, so specifically, but I just had to, uh, is young people don't think they're gonna get old. You know, I didn't think so either. You know, I should have, brought, <laughs> should have brought a picture of myself without the gray hair back in my army uniform and stuff like that. But I was, I was once young too. Uh, and it's a little bit mind bending. You know, you look at photographs. I show my kids pictures from before they were born. And if you stop and think about it, you know, most people think the world started the day they were born. Kind of seems that way, at least from one's own perspective. It didn't. Time will march on. And uh, the one thing you cannot replace is time. So time is the thing that people your age really have. That's your ace in the hole. That's what you have that I don't have, okay? And I have counseled many people my age who have come to me and said, okay, Mike, how do I save for retirement? I'm like, how old are you, Joe? Well, I'm 61. I said, when you're starting now? And they say, yeah, and I'm like, well, good luck to you. I mean, you can do something, something's better than nothing. But uh, compound interest is a big, big deal. And the longer runway you have, the more powerful it is. And Sylvia, in 30 years, doesn't, it's probably older than you are now, but in, in 30 years, it's coming. So you're just going to double your age and there it's, it's going to happen. And that train is just chugging down the track. Just jump on it now, please. That's young people get into the game early, please. That's, that's the one thing, whether you Listen to me or, or not. And that's the second time I think I've said that you can only listen to one thing. Well, that's the one thing I want you to listen to is, is start early. It's very, very important. Early, regular. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely agree. Something else that I was wondering was uh, what is a common financial mistake you see a lot of people making? The, the most common financial mistake I see people making is not being intentional. And what I mean by that is well, let's pretend we we're going to get into an automobile and go someplace. Well, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. Okay. So that's the behavior that for some reason, when it involves money, people don't think that they need to plan their route. Uh, now, these days with GPS and ways and things like that, it's kind of easy in a car, but you still plan your route. You, you say to the ways or you put punch into your car, hi, I want to go to 32 Main Street in my town and it will plot you the route and you follow the route. Well, it's the same thing with money. Uh, you can work the math backwards and plot your route from here. So and I'm sitting in New York, if I wanted to drive to California, well, I can drive that route or I, there's a series of shorter, I can only drive so far in a day or drive so far until lunch that, that first day of driving. So I should also plot out that route. So what, it comes down to, and very few people do it, but it's essential in my opinion, uh, is to budget. Uh, now, a lot of people hear the word budget and they think, oh, that's for poor people and people who are really you know, uptight about money and all the rest of that. <clears throat> no, actually the opposite is true. People who budget are intentional and they assign each dollar that they're going to receive in the following month a job to do before the month starts. Okay, so if you think about that, it then in the very first job is to save 10 or 15%, then you work from there. Now, 
modern technology has made it easy for people to forget they're spending money because you, you pull out your charge card, you pull out your uh, debit card. Uh, and just keep this in mind, when you go into a casino, those of you who've been, uh, they don't let you play with money. They make you turn the money in for chips. Why? Why do they do that? Why do they just let you play with money? It'd be a lot easier. Because once it's no longer green dollar bills in your hand, you tend to dissociate it. And it's just a, just a clay chip. It's not really money. That's wrong. It is money because you go back to the cashier's cage and you can cash it in. So some people, and this is a very old school practice, but it, but it wor works. Old school stuff still works. There are people who budget and will set up an envelope system, literally, and say, okay, first is going to Schwab and then the envelope with cash in it for the whoever does the shopping in the household. This is the cash we're going to use to buy food. This is the cash we're going to use to pay the rent. This is the cash. And literally, you do a cash economy. You don't have to do that. Debit cards are just as easy. And there's phone apps and things like that. But the most important thing that people overlook and such a common mistake is simply not to plan. And if, you know, failing to plan is planning to fail. That's another little clever one. But just plan. And, you know, a short-term, medium-term, long-term plan. And the best short-term plan is month-to-month -month budgeting. You know, I, I saw in one of your videos where you were, uh, and it really it was one of our funnier first interactions where you were debating you're walking around town and there was a nice gelato stand and you said, boy, that, that $6 or six euro, whatever it was, gelato sure would be tasty. And you said, you know, but I can get 80% of the satisfaction for a third of the price by buying the supermarket brand ice cream and eating it at home. Yeah, you, you can. And that's a perfectly fine decision. And you might remember, Sylvia, I said to you, well, just put it in your budget, you know, for the month before. I'm going to spend $20 in this, in this coming month on ice cream to reward myself. No obligation to spend that money on the ice cream, but it's already set aside. So the fact that a budget exists doesn't necessarily imply that you need to live like a monk or need to live, you know, like Gandhi or you know somebody like that. It just means that you're setting your priorities ahead of time. It says every makes every bit as much sense as when you get in your car when you turn the ignition key. You should know where you're going, right? So just view money the same way. It's, it's a trip. How am I going to get from here to there? Both mm -hmm. this week, this month, next month, six months, a year, five years, 10 years toward retirement. And if you just, you know, plot your route and do your very best to stay on it, you'll get there. Yeah, it's all about being intentional with how you spend your money, as you said. I love that word. It'd be intentional. Absolutely right. Now, we've talked about a lot of things and... Basically, what it also boils down to is being financially literate or knowing what you're talking about, what you're dealing with. Um, and as you said, it's sadly not something that is taught in school. So it's kind of in our, it's our own responsibility to educate ourselves. Are there any books or YouTube channels or maybe even podcasts that you would recommend um, for people to listen to, to watch, to read, just as a way to be more or become more financially literate? Well, absolutely. Um, YouTube is, is chock-a-block full of, of very good content. Uh, the thing about YouTube, of course, to keep in mind is anybody can have a YouTube account. Uh, so you have to you know, make sure it's quality content. My course, naturally, my very first recommendation is to never miss an episode of Catch Your Cravings uh, <laughs> because you're, uh, you, you, you dispense much, much wisdom there. Uh, there's a, a very good YouTube channel called Practical Wisdom. Um, if somebody would wants to know, and I've spent many, many hours on YouTube trying to figure out who, who the good guys are. If you want to know about investing, uh, there's a gentleman named uh, Joseph Hogue, H-O-G-U-E, who is uh, a credible uh, resource. Uh, someone you should follow. Uh, there are probably the third most popular radio talk show host in the United States is a gentleman named Dave Ramsey, who has a talk show for personal finance. And people call him up all the time with very basic questions. He has a YouTube channel full of, of, of wonderful content as well. So there's plenty of it out there. Uh, there are plenty, uh, plenty of phone apps uh, also to help one budget. 
Uh, some financial institutions are getting into the game. Your banks and so forth will have uh, different ways. So it, it's almost an embarrassment of riches as to how much stuff is out there. Uh, just be sure that you're getting it from someone who is not uh, profiting from it. So if something comes with a big commission, for example, an annuity sold by a life insurance company. Anything you can do with an annuity can be done without paying a commission to somebody. It's a very high commission product. Another example that people wouldn't think of is kind of morbid, nobody likes to think about it, but burial insurance in the United States. Those salesmen, the commissions on a burial insurance policy are like 35, 40%. And you think to yourself, you know, what, what are they doing? They're, sell they're selling you a, in a very, very expensive $10,000 life insurance policy. So in other words, so when one passes, your, your relatives or friends or who's ever going to dispose of your, you know, put you away forever, has the money to do it. Well, you don't need to buy an expensive, pay a 35% commission for that. Just save the money as part of it and, and direct it. You don't need to do that. So that's part of what being financially literate is about. And you have to always ask yourself, if someone's trying to sell you something, are they being paid to sell it? And in some cases they are, in some cases they're not. So uh, and it's just a little bit of research. Um, what about books that you recommend? Ah, okay. I'm kind of old school, as you can tell, perhaps from the gray hair. Anything by uh, one of the best money managers of all time was a gentleman named Peter Lynch, L-Y-N-C-H, just like it sounds. Uh, he had several different books. He's retired now. He ran Fidelity Magellan Fund, which is one of the few money managers who could actually beat the S&P 500 on a regular basis, uh, which is quite an achievement. Uh, and anything Peter Lynch wrote is gold. And uh, One Up on Wall Street is one of his books. You want to know what Warren Buffett read, who has become the, one of the world's wealthiest men strictly by investing. Uh, his Bible is a book called The Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham. Very, very basic book, but will help you understand the stock market. And finally, the, the third recommendation I would have is a book called A Random Walk Down Wall Street by Bert, Burton W. Machiel or something like that. He's an old professor. And by the way, these are books that were written a long time ago. Uh, so it won't have some of the latest financial fashions, if you want to call it that. But uh, I think you and I share that characteristic of uh, needing to master the things that are basic first uh, before you get involved with fancy you know, fads and things that won't necessarily last. Uh, those three books are classics, stand the test of time. Jim Cramer is another popular uh, personality on television. Uh, there's a, a show called Mad Money uh, here in the United States shown on CNBC. Kramer, uh, Jim Cramer was a hedge fund manager uh, also is very knowledgeable. Uh, a quick word about Kramer. He likes picking individual stocks. So if you have an interest enough in delving into the stock market beyond just investing in an index like SPY, as I spoke about, then Jim Kramer is a credible source. Interestingly enough, I have most of those books in my bookshelf, but I haven't read them yet. So definitely okay. will need to read them next. Yeah, I did know that's one thing I did take notice of, by the way, in your in your and one of the reasons I was attracted to calling you was what was on your bookshelf. Oh, like what's on my bookshelf. Yes. <laughs> I was wondering if there is this kind of money trap, you could call it, that even financial financially illiterate people tend to fall into. Yes. Um, it's temptation, a, a momentary failure of discipline. Uh, a shiny object, I'll look at the, the, the latest and greatest. So that's a temptation, particularly for, you know, life isn't all about, you have to have fun with your life. But uh, I'd say probably the biggest trap is losing your discipline, losing your focus uh, for that shiny object that you just have to have. And I did it too. You know, I'm not without sin, you know, particularly as a younger person. I, I probably... You know, my 20s were spent as a lieutenant in the United States Army, where half the time we were in the field, you know, freezing or getting rained on or, you know, whatever, pretending to thank God there were no war at the time. But 
still there was no place to spend money you were just chipmunks and raccoons and wolves and stuff out there and, and you but so when you got back and you cleaned up the tanks and so forth and now well here we are and now you got your money and you haven't spent it yet oh there it all goes in a day you know so and you could afford to be irresponsible as a young person in the army because they wouldn't let you starve there were rations and all the rest of that so i was as guilty as anybody but you know my awakening didn't come until after i got out of the army and then went, went into the real world and at about age 30 is when I got serious. Um, but I would have been a lot better off if I'd have gotten serious at age 20. Biggest money trap that even sophisticated people will fall into is just really simple. It's the, we've all seen the illustration that you got the angel on the one shoulder and the devil on the other shoulder talking to you. And it's when you listen to the devil is, uh, and if you listen to the devil once, it's okay, forgive yourself. Don't beat yourself up for it for the rest of your life. Just learn move on from there. Okay, so as a last question, I wanted to ask you what is the best and the worst financial advice that you have received? Ah, uh, okay. The best is um, it's a combination of uh, sound like a broken record, pay yourself first and be intentional. Put those two together, I guess. Can I cheat and have one and one B, I guess, one and one A, whatever. Uh, that's the best advice I've ever, ever got. Uh, the worst, um, and you'll hear this sometimes from accountants or kind of well-meaning people that say, oh, oh, it's okay, you can lease the car, just charge it off on your company. You need, you need the tax deduction. Okay, uh, if you stop and just think about that for a second, that's like saying you need to hand somebody a dollar and have them give you back 60 cents and think you're making money doesn't work. I mean, a tax deduction is just, you'll pay a little bit less tax. Trying, spending more money to get a tax deduction just doesn't make sense. But yet you hear it said so many times, oh, I need the tax deduction. Well, it's great. And the tax deductions are wonderful. If, you, you know, if, you, if you're a charitable person, I encourage that. And that's tax deductible. That's part of the reason the government makes it tax deductible. But if you gave a hundred or thousand or five hundred dollars or whatever it was to your favorite charity, understand, the government's not giving you the 500 back. It's just you're going to pay income tax on 500 fewer dollars than you did. But the best is pay yourself first, be intentional. And the worst is you need the tax deduction. Interestingly enough, the tax deduction advice is also something I've heard a lot. So it's interesting that you mentioned that as well. Well, just going you're out of your way for it. It makes no sense, you know, spending additional, spending an additional dollar so you can save, so someone can, can hand you back 60 cents and change. It's not, you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't walk up to someone in the street and hand them a dollar bill and say, all I need is 60 cents back and think you made 60 cents. You yeah. didn't, you lost 40 cents. <laughs> yeah. So it's not, just think of it that, it's just that simple, so. Yeah, I guess it's, it's because people feel like they're getting money later on that makes it attractive to them, I think. Yeah, well, it's also there's the and it, it's it's part of the getting a tax return check, which is another one. It's a very minor mistake that people make, by, but by over withholding uh, their amount, uh, then if they're paying too much tax to the government. What they're doing is they're loaning money to the government for free. Now, government's going to send it back to you, but why? You know, why would you do that? Just keep it in the first place and then in, invest it yourself. Um, so you know, you should pay the tax that's owed when it's due. And no more, don't, don't be more, uh, no, no reason to loan the government money. So thank you so much for sharing your time with us, sharing your knowledge with us, and um, just letting us ask you our questions. If any of you watching have any additional questions or follow-up questions that you'd like to ask Mike, then be sure to head on over to his website. I'll leave the link down below. You can schedule a free and no strings attached Zoom call with him. That's how I got, got to know Mike. And um, it's always so much fun and so interesting and eye-opening talking to you. Um, also, if you'd like to download Mike's free ebook, it's called Top Five Money Traps and How to Avoid Them. You can do that on his website as well. So thank you so much again for joining us. Sylvia, what a pleasure. And I'm I'm you know, catchy cravings is number one. I'm, you know, I got my little bell notification. I can't wait to see one of your videos and maybe someday I will uh, actually take out my frying pans and, and, and look at, look at that side of, of your, your very interesting life that you're leading. And what a pleasure. Thank you so much for the time this morning. Thank you.